So the goal of this talk is to go over a procedure that will allow us starting with a continuous function on an interval. So when I say interval, I actually include all of these possibilities, closed, both sides are finite endpoints, open, bounded, half closed, half open, bounded, and then all the ones which are stretched to infinity. Okay? So I'm including all of these when I possibility when I say interval. And I have a continuous function. I want to find all the local and endpoint maximum. So remember, local max means that it's uh, greater than or equal to values both in the immediate left and the immediate right. So it's a point in the interior. Local min means it's less than or equal to values in the immediate left and right. It's a point in the interior. Endpoint maximum means it's a power point at the end of the domain. Okay, which for an interval would just mean it's like if it's this thing, it's either A or B. This thing, what are the endpoints of this? Well, there's no endpoints in the domain, right? Hmm? Yeah. And this one, what are the endpoints in the domain of this? A. A, not B, because B is not in the domain. This one has B as an endpoint in the domain, and so on. So, so once you found the endpoints, which is either one or two, depending on if it's open or closed on a particular side, or zero, it's either zero, one, or two endpoints. For each, you figure whether it's a one-sided max or min. Okay. So if it's a left endpoint, you want to know whether it's a local max or min from the right. Right? Yeah. Okay. So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to do it using the first derivative test. Now the first derivative test, as you've seen in the past, has been a test that we use to check when you're given a critical point. So it, it goes something like this. So you have a function, you have a critical point, and the function is continuous. Okay, so the point is in the interior of the domain, the function is continuous to the point. You check the sign of the derivative on the immediate left and on the immediate right. So this is not the left-hand derivative or right-hand derivative. This is the derivative at points on the immediate left. This is the derivative at points on the immediate right. Okay, if there's constant sign, so if, there's, if this is plus and this is minus, that means it's increasing on the left, decreasing on the immediate right, and it's continuous at the point, then you get a local max, two-sided. Right? Mm -hmm. If it's minus and plus, let's make minus which so can see clearly which one switch. Okay. So if it's minus and plus, so decreasing immediate left, increasing immediate right, and uh, and and continuous at the point means it's min. If it's plus and plus, that means it's increasing on the left and on the right. So it's it's like a max from the left and a min from the right. So it's neither a max nor a min in the two-sided sense. Minus minus would mean uh, min from the left, max from the right, so neither overall. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this test we saw from the viewpoint of given a particular critical point, figure out whether it's a local max min point. But now we want to sort of repurpose this test to find all the local max min together. Right? You're sort of doing everything together, so you should be able to have some kind of economies of scale, right? You're, you, you won't be checking each one. I mean, you sort of want to do a procedure which will give you all of them together. Okay, it's the same thing. You can just do it a little more effectively. Okay, so great. So let's do it. So the first step is you compute F prime. Oh, I didn't say this right now. So of course, you know it by now if you're watching this video that uh, all the local max min are have to be at critical points, okay? Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, all the endpoint max min, well, the endpoint is only zero, one, or two of them, so there's no big deal about those. But the local max min have to be only at critical points. So our first goal is to narrow down what are the possibilities we are considering, right? So what I'm saying is you have you have a bunch of critical points. And all the points of local max are in here. Okay, and all the points of local min are also in here. They're all in here. And the points of local min are also all in here. So, sort of our goal is to sort of find all the critical points first and then filter them out, figure out which of them are points of local max, which of them are points of local min, and which are neither. Right? You can have critical points which are neither. That's what the two other cases of the first derivative test tell you. 
Okay. So we first compute f prime. Okay. How do you compute f prime? Well, that's that's what you learn differentiation techniques for, right? Okay. Uh, the next thing is find where f prime is undefined. And we get about points where, so since f is already continuous on an interval, I'm assuming that, we get about the points where f is defined but f prime is undefined, right? In the domain of f. Okay. Find the, all the x where it's zero. And together, the solutions to these two things will give you what? Critical points. Yeah. And these are precisely the candidates for local maximum. Okay, not all of them will actually give you points of local maximum. So what's the definition of critical point? It's a point in the interior of the domain where f prime say, is at a zero mm -hmm. all the things yes yeah right well the endpoints the derivative two side derivative won't exist but those aren't considered critical points those are covered separately as endpoints okay now the next thing is this is what you do in order to be able to apply the fourth derivative find the sign of f prime on each interval between successive critical points. So this sort of doesn't make sense if you have too many critical points. So I'm assuming, well, in order to make sense of this, you need the function to be behave nicely enough. You don't want your critical points to cluster anywhere. But nice functions behave nicely. So. Say like you have, uh, let's say your function has a number line. The domain is somewhere in here. Let's say let's say you have a b is here. Suppose your domain is just closed interval a b. You found these critical points. I should also include the end. Also include endpoints. And in those. Okay, so basically what your critical points are doing, so these three points, let's say C1, C2, C3 here. Mm -hmm. Your original interval was A, B, but the C1, C2, C3 have subdivided your interval into four pieces, right? These four, what are the pieces? A, C1. Well, I'll just write the open intervals. A, C1, C1, C2, 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 C3, and C3B. You have to find the sign of F prime on these intervals. And because of the nature of F prime, it's the derivative of, the, of a function, the sign will not change, will not, will be constant within each such piece. Okay? Now, uh, well, that, the reason that's just a little tricky, you can think of it like F prime is is almost continuous. Now, f prime actually doesn't have to be continuous. There are some weird counterexamples where the derivative is, is not continuous uh, on something, but uh, but it still actually satisfies what's called the intermediate value property, and which means that it cannot jump from positive to negative without either going through zero or becoming undefined in between. So on each of these, it has a constant sign. Okay. Means within each interval, it's either completely positive or completely negative. Okay, and your goal is to figure out for each interval what the sign is. Now what? If you figure out the sign of the derivative in each of the intervals, then what can you do? Hmm? You can find out where it becomes zero. Well, we already figured out where, where, the, where the derivative becomes zero. 
then you can but now whether it is a local extreme or local maximum. Now you can use the first derivative test at each of the critical points, right? Mm -hmm. And also the one-sided first derivative test at the end points. Well, that's right, that is the next thing. So right? So I'll show you on that thing a little later. Because that's the information, the sign information from file is what you need to use the first derivative test. And use one-sided first derivative test at endpoints if, if there are any. So one-sided is just saying like if the if it's a right endpoint, then if on the left thing is positive, then it's a local maps on the left. Right? Endpoints. Okay. Now, actually, uh, the first error test actually gives us a uh, strict thing. So, if 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 the signs are actually positive here, so there's positive negative. So, you will actually get strict local maximum from this test. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, now, now let me just illustrate it with this. So here, if you want to figure out what's happening at C1, well, what two intervals will you look at? The sign of the derivative on what two intervals will you look at? A, C1, C1, C2. A, C1 and C1, C2. Okay, and based on that information, then you look at this table. The C is C1 and now the A, C1 will tell you this column what to look at and C1, C2 will tell you this column what to match and then you'll see whether it's maximum or neither. Then similarly at C2, you'll be looking at C1, C2 and C2, C3, right? You'll figure out how to match. Uh, then similarly at C3, you'll look at C2, C3 and C3, B. Now for the end point, the end point A, you'll look at the interval A, C1, right? Whatever sign you figured out. And for the end point B, you'll look at the interval C3, B. Okay, so this is the procedure. Now, now what's the trickiest part of this? Well, generally speaking, there's, there's one part of this which, which is often confuses people, which is five. Step five, right? This is where you're actually doing the work that allows you to use the first derivative test. Right? The rest of it is sort of common between, like if instead of the first derivative test, you want to use the second derivative test. Most of the rest of the process is similar. But this step, where you're trying to find the sign of the derivative between points, that's tricky. So the reason it's tricky is because you are trying to find the sign on an interval rather than at a specific point. So, so there's, there's, there's many ways you could do this. So one is, so you could do this either by evaluating at any random point at, let's evaluate, evaluate at any point inside the interval. So what I mean by that is what I mean by that is let's say you have you're trying to figure out the sign of the derivative on this interval AC1. Okay? Now what you do is you just pick some random point here. Now in, in an actual question you know what A is, you know what C1 is and you know what F is. You just pick an actual number which is somewhere between A and C1. Okay? And you just evaluate the, the derivative F prime which you've computed here at that point. And you just check whether the number you get is positive or negative. Because the sign is constant on A C1, it's just enough to evaluate at any actual point. Uh, the other approach which is doesn't rely on evaluation is the so this is one way you could do it. The other approach is you factor F prime and then reason about the signs of each factor. And this is particularly useful if you have polynomials or other things which, which factor nicely. And where the factors, the signs of the factors, you can easily figure out whether 
whether they're positive or negative depending on how those factors are placed right with the critical points. Let me take an, an example. Not a full example, just an example illustrating this part. So let's say my function is, uh, my derivative turns out to be Uh, x minus c1 square x minus c2 cubed x minus c3 that's the derivative okay now if i'm on a c1 what can i say the first part is positive this thing whatever the sign of this you're squaring it so that's positive mm -hmm. The second part is negative. So you are, it's a negative thing because x is to the left of c2. So negative cube is negative and this is also okay. negative. So overall you get a positive. So your f prime is positive. Now, it's even easier, once you've got one interval, then moving across is easy. Because when you move across c1, then, then, then the only thing that changes is the factor corresponding to c1. Right? Mm -hmm. And in this case, it won't change at all because it already had an even power on it. Right? Mm -hmm. So you'll get what? C1, C2? F prime is still positive. Because the only factor that could have changed is the one which involved x minus C1 and that didn't change because it was squared. What about C2, C3? Mm -hmm. now, now it does change because you have an odd power on x minus C2. But we can do the whole analysis again. So x minus C1, so that's still positive x minus c2 now is positive, cube be positing here positive, x minus c3 is negative, so positive times negative is negative, and c3b? Negative. Hmm? Why? So you moved across c3 now, right? It was negative. Oh, it's positive. Positive. Okay, so uh, so we see now we got the signs easily through algebraic reasoning without having to pick a point and evaluate. And now you could actually, if you want, if you, want you can use the first derivative test right here. Let's just do it illustrated. We'll do numerical examples later, but let's just finish this. So at C1, what do you get? Positive on the left, positive on the right, so neither. Or let's just do that. Or let's just do C1, C2, C3, then we'll do the endpoints. At C2, positive on the left, negative on the right. That so means... Local map. And at C3? Local minimum. Okay, now endpoints. At A, it's derivative is positive on the immediate right. So it's a endpoint minimum. And you have an endpoint maximum at B. Okay. So, so the algebra case is pretty nice because in that case you can figure out the signs just by looking at how the signs of the factors change across the points. And you can also see that when you have even powers, you're going to get neither. And when you have odd powers in the derivative, then it will change sign, which means that you will have a local maximum and depending on how the signs are interacting. Uh, but if this factoring thing isn't working, if it's not a polynomial, or if it's something pretty complicated, you can always do the evaluate at a point, because then you have to evaluate. So remember, you're evaluating, what are you evaluating? Are you evaluating f, evaluating the function, What are you evaluating? The first of the derivative. Yeah. So you're actually evaluating, just to clarify this, you're actually evaluating f prime. Okay, good. Uh, now one more thing I want to say is, is what happens if you have infinitely many critical points? So what happens if your function is actually has, is like a trigonometric function? Okay, so what happens for trigonometric functions or more generally, periodic functions, which have infinitely many critical points. Do you have to do this analysis at infinitely many points? No. 
what do you do? Sure, c value of the function that is the smallest interval. Oh, and what, like within one period. Yes. So you just do the analysis within one period and then the maximum, the local maximum and minimum will be periodic. Now, actually, it's a little more general than just periodic functions. Suppose your function has periodic derivative. Then, because all this analysis involves the derivative, right? It, this, it's still true that you can just do the analysis on one period, right? Mm -hmm. And so the points of local max and min will actually repeat in a periodic fashion, okay? But the local max min values will not be the same. But the local max min values will change because the function is not itself periodic. So let me take uh, write down an example. We won't do the full analysis, but. Let's write down one example. So let's say you have a x minus 2 sin x. Is this function periodic? No. No. What's the derivative? Cosine x and cos 2 cosine x. Well, one, the x will also 1 be minus. 1 minus 2 cosine x, right? This is periodic. Since the derivative is periodic, uh, the the behavior as far as what are the critical points, which of them are local maximum, that behavior will be periodic. Okay, but the actual uh, values of the at the local max or local min, the local max min values will not be periodic. So the points of local max min will have periodic behavior. Local maximum values, although they are not periodic, there is still a regularity to them. They will actually just be getting shifted by a constant amount. But they still aren't repeated in the night sense, right? So the picture will be something like this type of picture. Okay? You will have these local maximum values. But you notice that the values are not the same, even though the points where they occur repeat uh, have this repetition, the values are. Okay. Perfect.